It's unconditional, our commitment is, and the reason is that runaway gas prices, runaway grocery prices, runaway utility bills. We really need to restore price stability, get inflation back down to 2%. I expect the upward pressure in prices will continue for some time. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, in for Francine Lacqua. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Unconditional commitment. Jay Powell again vows to beat inflation, while Fed Governor Michelle Bowman backs another 75 basis point hike. Stocks move higher and Treasuries trim gains. And double defeat, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson suffers heavy losses in two special elections as the chair of his party quits. Historic step, the European Union grants Ukraine candidate status while EU leaders devise strategies to weather Russia's gas supply cuts. Happy Friday. You made it to the end of the week. We're ending this week with some breaking data coming in on Germany's June EFO expectations coming in much weaker than expected, coming in at 85 and a half. The estimate had been 87 Point four. Now, business confidence index, that also dropping more than expected as well at 92.3. 92.8 was the expectation. So that's not as big of a miss as the expectations there as well. Uh, again, current assessment, 99.3. That actually beat the estimate of 99. So June IFO, I just want to make sure I say this right. I misspoke previously. June IFO business confidence index, it was a miss. 92.3, the estimate was for 90. 2.8. So again, a miss, not a massive miss, but again, this comes in the context of data disappointing throughout Europe. We had PMIs yesterday at a 16-month low. It's those recessionary signals filtering through the bond market. We are seeing some bond buying. You can see mostly up by about three bips in most of this market. So not as large as yesterday. However, it is clear that there's fear in this market. Germany, the German finance uh, chancellor there saying that he expects a Lehman-like moment if the gas crisis continues in the region. So there you go. Some point moves higher on the indexes. Let's get a look at your overall market environment then. So those individual indices up as is the main index. Europe stock 600, that's up eight tenths of 1%. It follows on from a U.S. rally yesterday that is continuing in the futures index. It's this reevaluation of the inflationary story as quick, nearly as quick as we put those inflation trades on. It looks like we're taking it off with the drop down in the commodity sector with the do whatever it takes approach coming from the Fed. Are they going to be able to keep going or is inflation going to come down or is something going to break in this economy? Still, we are looking at two-year yields. Those are bid yet again. The yields there lower by three and a half basis points. We're looking at a pretty sizable move down of about 20 basis points in the two-year yield so far this week. Some Fed rate hike repricing. It's happening globally as well, I should say. And again, a large part of that is the move down in metals. Copper, that's LME copper there, down more than one and a half percent, down 20 percent from the high. So we're getting into this environment where we're pricing a recession in metals, in oil as well, despite a very tight market. Let's look at your overall European picture with the map. Again, it's mostly going to be green across the board, as we've been saying. It's not necessarily confidence in the economy that's driving us there. Instead, it is indeed this fear of a recession. But if rate hikes back off, if they're not as aggressive in terms of tightening, that's when we could see this rally filtering through and again, picking up steam in the European session this morning. So to that macro story, the Fed Chair Jerome Powell once again promising to do all he can to curb runaway inflation during his second day testifying before Congress. Inflation is, um, is, is uh, happening everywhere now. More of our uh, inflation is from demand, and we do have tools to deal with demand. Our tools are, are they're blunt, but they are the right tools to deal with, with broad aggregate demand. We're very far from our inflation target. Our intent, of course, is to bring inflation down to 2%. Inflation getting back to 2%, get inflation back down to 2%. It's unconditional, our commitment is. That path has gotten more and more challenging thanks to you know, the, the effects on oil prices and food prices. People do expect inflation to come back down to levels that are consistent with our price stability mandate. Without that, we're not going to be able to have a sustained period of maximum employment. Meanwhile, Fed Governor Michelle Bowman adding to the hawkish chorus by backing a 75 basis point hike in July, as well as increases of at least 50 basis points in the next few meetings. Now, let's get to some of the key market drivers. Our Markets Live reporter, Simon White, joins us in the studio now. Simon, thanks for joining. So, I mean, look, it does feel like this really big rethink in the markets. Is it a head fake or is it sort of acknowledgement that the Fed is going to be able to get inflation under control? 
I think it's uh, a combination of things. I think the, the Fed has um, obviously been very hawkish right now. But in terms of how hawkish they ultimately need to be to truly get inflation back into a sort of low and stable regime, um, they're probably nowhere near. Like very controversially, they probably need to be doing something like another five percentage points wow. of tightening. Now, they're not going to do that. Because yeah. right now the focus is on the cost of living crisis. So we're, we're seeing some hawkish talk. But we'll move into the midterms. The political pressure will probably ease off in the Fed. By that point, leading indicators are telling you that growth is uh, slowing, will mm. slow more. Unemployment could well be rising by then. Right. And then I think we'll flip and it will be the pressure will be on the Fed to you know, back off a little bit. They're yeah. talking kind of like tough right now. But once they're in that environment, I think it'll be a very different situation. And you'll find that they are talking about easing. Mm. But it'll be way too early because the inflation problem is still there. I, I was going to say, is that, is that kind of the environment that they want to get to in a way? They want to bring demand down in line where supply is and supply is extremely tight. So isn't that kind of like the scenario that we're looking forward to? This is this is exactly they'll get to this, but it, it, on an interim timescale. So they'll they'll be lulled into a kind of um, false sense of security. Now the 70s is an imperfect analogy, but the same kind of thing happened. You had way too easy settings. Um, the Fed was hiking uh, into the you know the early 70s, but then we hit the recession. Political pressure then switched. They started to cut way too early. Mm. Inflation it came off, but then it started to rise again. And the second half of the 70s was where it went crazy you had the right. double digit inflation and it really laid the situation for uh, the next fed governor paul volcker to have the man of you know rate hikes that mm. really solved inflation but we're not there yet we're going to have to go through these stages to get to that point wait so are, are you sort of in this camp this idea that okay one of two outcomes either the fed backs off they're not as aggressive we don't get a recession but inflation stays high or they have to induce a recession. They need to continue to be aggressive, maybe maybe five percent, um, in order to get inflation down. It's either or. I think I think that they will. They probably got the mandate now for a shallow recession. Okay. But that's not going to be enough to get us back to the the, re, the inflation regime of before. And I think that will lay the groundwork. We'll have to see some sort of serious damage done before you can have someone that's probably not Powell. He's yeah. probably fighting the last war. Right. Uh, and someone else that can come along and really do what it's going to take. Now, it's not definitely going to happen like that, but, you know, as much as the 70s is an imperfect analogy, some things don't change. The behavioural aspects don't change. Monetary policy uh, becomes more interfered by political... Uh, political interference, we're seeing that today as it happened in the 70s. Mm. So I think there's more similarities and differences and we could end up in a very similar situation. And, and part of sort of what, what, what helped add fuel to this fire in terms of a global a rally into bonds, that haven asset was yesterday, these really weak euro area PMI numbers. Mm. And of course the ECB has an even more difficult task given that inflation, energy inflation is hitting them so hard and the economy is already sh starting to show that signs of weakness. How much does that bleed into the global asset picture, this fear emanating from Europe? Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be problematic. I mean, we're already seeing it obviously ripple across um, all markets. I think now, unfortunately, like markets are very kind of um, unhinged, if you like. They're, they're much more responding to price. So levels are really important when it comes to markets. Technicals are very important right now. But the underlying picture is, of course, you know, rates have moved higher. They're having an impact across the economy. Um, you know, and that will continue to happen. What I think will be interesting to note is the next potential shoe to drop, which hasn't really been uh, come into the data, mm. is the, the earnings. Mm, earnings yeah. are still relatively elevated. They don't look like they've caught up. But every le leading indicator you look at, whether it's like the, the fall in unemployment or the rise in, uh, or sorry, the fall in CEO confidence and sentiment, they all point to much weaker earnings. And, and perhaps that's the reason why equities are rallying. I mean, I know they're rallying because the Fed expectations coming off, but despite recession, I, I really like, we have a viewer writing in that I want to ask you their question because I think, I think it's really smart in this environment. Where is that inflection point where bad news will be bad news once again? Because if how we're trading in this market today is bad news of a recession, mm. I mean, the stock market, doesn't seem too bothered. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's that getting an inflection point is, is very difficult. I think we're going to continue in this environment for a while. I mean, look, the stock market generally goes up and it always looks for reasons for going up. Um, I think we could see the rally extend for the next, um, you know, at least the next few weeks. But there's a significant number of headwinds that suggest that the actual 
proper law, the tradable law, is not yet in. Normally you see signs of capitulation mm. and we haven't really seen signs of outright panic. We've seen a lot of negativity, right. but we haven't seen the signs of outright panic. All right, Simon, thank you so much. That's our M Live Simon White breaking all things markets down for us. Now coming up, IFO Institute President uh, Clemens Fust on the German economy after IFO, I should say, business climate expectations and confidence came in below expectations. That is next. We also have some pictures for you coming from Brussels at the EU summit. Schultz is speaking there, talking about the need to accelerate efforts to diversify away from German gas, saying that they're well prepared for Russian fossil fuel import issues. We'll bring you the latest from the meeting throughout the morning. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, German business confidence unexpectedly deteriorated in June. The IFO expectations index declined to 85.8. That's below the estimates of 87.4. Now, this is all happening as Europe's largest economy grapples with energy supply issues, rampant inflation, and component shortages. For more, we're joined by Clemens Fuß, president of the IFO Institute. So, Clemens, we have some numbers coming in here, some negative readings when it comes to especially, as you say, to the energy-intensive industries. Last month, you said there were no observable signs of a recession. Given these most latest figures, has that changed in your mind? Uh, I think the likelihood of a recession is clearly increasing. There is a lot of pes pessimism about the gas situation. A month ago, uh, the risk seemed smaller that Russia will cut off gas supplies. Now, uh, gas supplies have been reduced. Nobody knows whether that's permanent or whether that will go down to zero, but the risk is rising, and that's why the energy-intensive sectors are worried. Uh, energy prices are rising. And that also has an impact on the rest of the economy. For instance, in retail, companies seem to fear that as consumers spend more on gas, on heating, they will spend less on, on clothing and, and other things they buy. Uh, and uh, so yeah. the overall picture is rather gloomy. Rather gloomy. So the odds of a recession are increasing. But, but are they beyond likely? Is it beyond 50 percent? How prepared do you think we need to be? for that level of downturn? Well, I think we need to see the timing. I think there is there are a few dangers of a recession this year because the gas shortage uh, will have a strong impact uh, in the winter. Now we are out of the heating season, so we're still OK. But uh, if uh, Russia does reduce uh, gas supplies uh, further, uh, what our forecasts say is we will get a recession, but in 2023. Not before that. There, there's also mm. some support for the economy coming from the sectors affected by the corona pandemic, like um, uh, uh, hotels, restaurant, uh, restaurants. So uh, I think uh, for this year, uh, we are safe. But, uh, you know, depending on gas supplies, there may be a recession next year. And the likelihood currently certainly rises. Well, the economy minister Habak yesterday said that after he raised, we're looking at a full screen of this now, raising the gas plan to stage two of alarm, um, that the risk of a collapse in the energy sector is there should the flow get disrupted more. He called it on a Lehman-like level. Is the risk that acute? Do you foresee a Lehman-like event uh, in terms of the energy complex? This warning is strong, but uh, I think to some extent justified, because we need to see that if energy prices rise very strongly, one issue is can the energy companies pass this on to the consumers? So the government has legislation that would allow that. Uh, but we need to be prepared. If the gas prices are passed on to the consumers, this will have a very strong impact on them, uh, and um, that is a risk. But if we don't do anything, it may very well be that some energy companies collapse because their costs are rising and their revenues aren't. So it's a serious situation. We need to prepare for that, meaning 
uh, we need to make sure that uh, there are gas savings now. And that in turn uh, requires, does require higher prices for consumers, for manufacturing, uh, so that they reduce the, get the right market signals and reduce their prices. You've started to see that concern ripple through businesses, be it in your latest EFO survey, be it just in some of the action of corporates, BSF, BASF cutting their production, BMW looking to buy electricity from third-party services instead of their own gas-powered plants. Concerns of a pullback in investment, is there that concern and could it lead to long-term scarring in the German economy? Yes, I think there is the risk, mainly because we have this very high uncertainty about what's going on, uh, about in particular the gas supply situation. And the rising uncertainty means that uh, doing nothing, waiting, uh, stopping investment projects and, and waiting to see how these things develop gets more valuable. So that's what, what companies will do. They will reduce their investments. Uh, and, and wait how this continues. So, um, as I said, uh, this may add uh, to the risks um, of a recession next year. I don't think it's going to have a very strong impact mm. now because investment is held back anyway by bottlenecks. Uh, but, well, Clemens, um, does that mean we're not at the point and... or are we at the point where we should start to see gas rationing taking place? Are we there yet? I don't think we are yet, there yet, and we might not get gas rationing at all, but an auctioning system which is being prepared. And that means uh, if, if companies are ready to pay very, very high prices, they will probably not be rationed. But uh, in terms of economic impact, it's very similar to rationing because if, it's, you know, if gas costs are too high, some companies will just be forced out of the market. All right, Clemens, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Clemens Foos, president of the EFO Institute, speaking to us after the latest uh, survey results coming out. Now let's get to the Bloomberg First Word News. With that is Alice Atkins. Alice. Hi, Danny. Boris Johnson has suffered a major election upset, losing a formerly safe UK Parliament seat in southwest England. The Liberal Democrats overturned a 24,000 Conservative Party majority to take the rural constituency of Tiverton and Honiton. In a separate election, Johnson's party was beaten by Labour, raising fresh questions about the Prime Minister's popularity. The Conservative Party chairman also quit after the result, saying we cannot carry on with business as usual. The US Senate has passed a bipartisan gun safety bill. Legislation held as the biggest breakthrough on the issue in decades. It aims to improve background checks, secure schools and fund states to combat gun violence. The bill now goes to the House of Representatives. Just hours earlier, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a New York law limiting public handgun carry laws, a ruling that could mean more guns on the streets of big cities. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Danny? Alice, thanks so much. Alice Atkins there. Now, coming up, we're in Brussels for day two of what has been a historic EU summit. Ukraine, Moldova, formally placed on the path to union membership. Topping today's agenda, energy security. We'll have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, it's the second day of a historic summit of EU leaders in Brussels. Yesterday, both Ukraine and Moldova were granted candidacy status for membership of the union. Now, Georgia at the same time was told it could win the same status if it met certain conditions. All three countries are part of our European family. We've never let any doubt about that. And today's historic decision by leaders confirms that. It grants all three the perspective of EU accession and it lays down the path ahead. I think this is a moment of great satisfaction and I'm very pleased with the leaders' endorsement of our opinions. There can be no better sign of hope for the citizens of Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia in these troubled times. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo in Brussels. So we're, we've just seen leaders arriving at the summit moments before. Certainly a lot of challenges remain, particularly on the economic front. Maria, how do they work through this? 
Yeah, and Danny, you know, yesterday you could argue was a celebration, that historic moment that the head of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, alluded to there. But today really is a sobering up as a result of the economy. And Danny, just picture the scene. We know that the European Central Bank, of course, is going to take rates higher. Inflation continues to be a problem. Yesterday we had that incredible language. Like, really, we, we should really highlight uh, the language coming out of Germany and the German economy minister, Mr. Habeck, where he says we're facing potentially a gas crisis. This could be a Lehman uh, moment and today a lot of concern now and a lot of officials don't want to say this on the record just yet but behind the scenes a lot of concern about Russia unilaterally at one point as a result of politics cutting off gas flows and the reality is that we're still at a stage in which Europe is trying to bring up the storage but of course that is still a challenge they have the entire summer to prep for this but they worry about the shape of the storage come September and then of course you have the winter and the most vulnerable time of the year for Europe European economies when it comes to that dependency on gas. So, Danny, there is a mm. lot of challenges here. It does seem like this okay. is almost a perfect storm that's proving for Europe and for the time being, not a plan B that comes out of this meeting. Maria, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo there. Now, coming up, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson suffers heavy losses in two special elections. We're going to talk UK politics with Sir Vince Cable next. This is Bloomberg. Unconditional commitment. Jay Powell again vows to beat inflation while Fed Governor Michelle Bowman backs another 75 basis point hike. Stocks and treasuries move higher. Historic step. The European Union grants Ukraine st candidate status while EU leaders devise strategies to weather Russia's gas supply cuts. German business confidence declines as the nation faces energy constraints. And double defeat. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson suffers heavy losses in two special elections as the chair of his party's quits. We'll speak shortly with former Lib Dem leader Sir Vince Cable. Good morning. Happy Friday and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Well, let's stick with that UK story with Boris Johnson suffering two defeats in special elections. The results raise questions surrounding the prime minister's election winning potential. Oliver Dowden has resigned as the party's chairman saying this morning we cannot carry on with business as usual. For more for more, we're joined from Westminster by Bloomberg's Laura Wright. All right, Laura, how bad is this for Boris Johnson? It's been a terrible night for the Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Voters expressing their discontent with the government at the ballot box. It's why the resignation of Conservative Party Chairman Oliver Dowden is being viewed as a distraction from the real problem that is Boris Johnson. If we break down the details, Wakefield and Yorkshire returned to Labour with a 12% swing. It was one of the red wall seats, if you remember, that the Conservatives claimed back in 2019 with a get Brexit done mandate in Tiverton and Hoverton. In Devon. That result in particular is being seen as a political landslide. It's been a Conservative seat all the way back since 1920 and the Lib Dems have overturned a 24,000 Conservative majority, the largest Conservative majority to be overturned in by-election history. These losses, Danny, fueling rumours that Conservative MPs are vying to organise another vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister ahead of the usual 12-month mm. gap from the last which took place in early June. Laura, we had some data also out early this morning on UK consumer confidence. There's concerns about the uh, cost of living crisis. How is that impacting the political landscape? UK citizens' incomes are being squeezed. And as you mentioned, UK consumer confidence data out overnight reached a record low, minus 41. To put that in context, minus 30 is typically a bearish recession indicator. UK inflation earlier this week at a 40-year high. Real wages are falling. Purchasing power is being diminished. The economy is grinding to a halt. And interestingly, a recent poll from YouGov shows that if a general election were to be held today, the opposition Labour Party would have a six percentage point lead. But don't underestimate the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, Danny. They say he makes a cat with nine lives look mortal. All right, Laura, thank you very much. Laura, right there outside of Westminster. Let's dig into this more. We're joined by Sir Vince Cable, former leader of the UK's Liberal Democrat Party and former Secretary of State for Business. Thanks so much for joining this morning. We have to start with this remarkable and historic set of results in Tiverton and Huntington. So you have this, you have your party win, a swing of 30 percent. 
Is this something that can be replicated elsewhere in the country? Well, it's already been happened twice before. This is the third in succession of spectacular by-election wins in areas where the Conservatives and the Lib Dems are the two parties in contention. So there is already a pattern, uh, and it's partly deep unpopularity of the government, partly Lib Dems have a good record in local campaigning, mm. um, but also, in, and highly significant, the fact that Labour voters are voting tactically for Liberal Democrats where we th they think we have a chance of winning, and that is something that could well carry through to a general election. I mean, just how extreme you say, okay, it's, it's already happened before, this is just another instance. How many other Tory seats are you eyeing? Well, they, there's a list of, I think, 40 target seats. That may be ambitious, but indeed after yesterday, uh, maybe not all that ambitious. Hmm. But certainly in the suburbs of the big cities, not just in the south, but, but Manchester, Stockport, uh, in the southwest of England where the... Uh, Liberal Democrats have traditionally been strong. Yeah, there are, there are different parts of the country where we could well break back to the position of strength that we had a decade or more ago. So I know you've said previously that perhaps the Tories losing these seats were, were a bit p baked into the price. But does the extent of loss, does it tell us anything about Boris Johnson's appeal? Has he lost that ballot box appeal? Uh, he has, but, you know, he's a skillful politician and uh, David Cameron's description of him as the greased piglet uh, probably is fitting. Mm. I mean, he does get out of scrapes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think the Tories are beginning to panic. You know, this idea of changing their rules so they can have a fresh leadership election. Do you think they'll do that? Well, they're talking about it. Uh, I mean, the problem they have is that quite apart from Boris Johnson's personal uh, failings, uh, which were clearly a, a major part in the results yesterday, is that the economy is deteriorating and, and it's no, there's no obvious end in sight. You know, we haven't yet begun to see the impact of uh, the likely slide in sterling, which mm. is almost certainly going to happen over the next few months. There's the Russian gas squeeze that happened last week that is going to feed through into even higher fuel prices than we had expected. Uh, we've got the impact of, you know, Britain being the weakest of the G7 countries in terms of growth, expecting mm. this higher interest rate recession. I mean, all this is terrible news if you're an incumbent government. And whether they stick with Boris Johnson or get somebody new, they're going to face this tsunami coming towards them in the latter part of this year and beginning of next year. Well, you, you've written about before, spoken about before, this idea of, of needing to have a sacrificial lamb. I know you've spoken about this in the context of Rishi Sunak. We had um, Oliver Dowden resign, resigning after these results is enough. Do those things go far enough if it is this tsunami that hits the UK economy? Well, the Oliver Dowden resignation is not particularly significant, I and mean, I, I don't think there'll be a great deal of uh, sorrow for him. I mean, he was somebody who threw in his lot with the, the Johnson people, though he was initially a kind of reforming Cameroon. He changed sides, and he's paid the price for it. Um, but I think the important question they will have to face is, could anybody do any better? Could they? And, and the awkwardness I think they have is that, that they have some people, you know, Jeremy Hunt is a good example, who might have broader popular appeal, but they're not popular with the party Well, well you, you talk about this tsunami coming, and I do think this is an interesting question. What actually can be done? Because it's, it's, it's a global crisis we're facing, right? It's not just the UK. There are specific idiosyncratic issues here. But, but what can be done to soften the blow from these economic pressures? Well, governments can't stop it because, as you quite really say, it's a global crisis. But I think a mixture of short-term palliatives, I mean, the, the idea that Ed Davey was talking about, of a general cut in value-added tax, which is disinflationary, um, one of, if you're going to use the tax mechanism, a good way to do it. I think more to ensure that the really vulnerable people are not sucked into the kind of World Bank, the, the food bank mm. um, situation, low paid workers, a lot more could be done on the kind of universal credit improvement. And then long, I think the real problem with the British economy and one of the reasons why we're in a worse position than many European countries or the states is the complete collapse of business confidence. You know, we yes. just don't we just have... had those numbers. Yeah, yeah, well. and the, you know, business investment is dire. It's been dire since the Brexit vote. It's getting worse, and business has no sense. You know, a government that's moving from day to day has mm. no kind of long-term perspective. You know, we had, when I was in government, and indeed under the Tories afterwards, an industrial strategy. We had a kind of five-year view looking ahead, and that kind of perspective is totally lacking, and it needs to come back. 
Uh, again, though, you know, I have to go back to this idea that so much of it is about the energy crisis we're facing. It's about the war in Ukraine. I know we're talking about this in, in sort of the political context, but just how concerned are you about the UK economy in terms of a recession? Do you think that this is going to come soon, assuming we stay on this path? What are your predictions? Well, th there is a general problem affecting all major developed countries and developing countries even worse, true. Uh, but, but I think the UK, it's, we're particularly vulnerable because of uh, the way inflation is relatively high, growth is relatively poor. Uh, and I, I think even people who are not partisan, as I am, are, are predicting that we're going to get into a recession later this year, beginning of next year. And with, with, unfortunately, with worse to come. I mean, this, yeah. this, is, this is the awkwardness. One of the, one of the possibilities that people do need to think about, I mean, I'm not predicting this, is that the Tories might actually risk an early general election uh, because they know so much um, be trouble is coming. And if you've got a new leader, it would be an obvious thing to do. Isn't that really risky at this moment, it, it's though? It's highly risky, but it's, a, it, it's the kind of thing Johnson might do. He's a risk taker, he's a gambler. And if they got a new leader who might try to replicate what John Major did, 1991-92, fresh face, um, looking for a new mandate. And, and mm. the Labour Party did, did well in Wakefield, you know, the good result. Sure. But it wasn't spectacular. It's not the kind of swing you would expect as, as sort of Tony Blair enjoyed back in 1997. So if I were doing a bit of forward thinking, I would factor in the possibility that however implausible it mm. seems this morning, the Tories might see advantage in a quick run to the electorate in the autumn. I know you say you don't want to make predictions, but I have to say you said in, around in May time that uh, we might see a fight picked with the EU over the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, and about a month later that, that did indeed happen. And you said this sort of in the context of the minister trying to shore up his authority. So that's already happened. Do you expect more to take place in terms of Brexit? Um, as Johnson faces these issues? Well, his style is very much to look for these uh, wars, uh, c conflicts, which give some short-term advantage. Um, it's not obviously working for them, but they're very strongly tempted to do it. Brexit is one of the few things that unites this government, as we d discovered yesterday with the analysis and the economy. It's almost certainly not been good for the UK. It's a slow puncture that's doing long-term damage. But nonetheless, politically, for Johnson, it's his one achievement with his own supporters. And okay. so they're going to look for little fights. Um, the danger, of course, is that it uh, doesn't just... Uh, creating division in the UK, but it's antagonizing our American friends who Biden hates all this stuff, doesn't want conflict mm. with Ireland. So th the government, I think, has been rather foolish to do it, but if they, get, they may feel they're getting some short-term traction with their own supporters. Okay. Vince, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there out of okay. time. Sir Vince Cable, former leader of the UK Liberal Democrat Party and former Secretary of State for Business, thanks so much for joining us. Now, coming up, venture capital's diversity problem. We're going to be joined by Rick Lewis, chair of Impact X and owner of Britain's largest black run business, to discuss underrepresented founders. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Let's get to your Bloomberg Business Flash. With that is Alice Adkins. Hi, Alice. Hi, Danny. Wall Street's biggest banks are set to return tens of billions of dollars to investors after passing the Fed's annual stress tests. The bank showed they had enough capital to handle a cocktail of surging unemployment, collapsing real estate prices and a plunge in stocks. More than 30 lenders were tested by the U.S. Central Bank. Bloomberg has learned that Deutsche Bank's board has agreed to take a pay cut after criticism over the widespread use of private communication channels like WhatsApp among staff. The lender is among several firms under investigation by U.S. authorities over the use of private messaging that can't be archived. Top execs at the bank are set to see a €75,000 cut to bonuses. Netflix has laid off another 300 employees as the streaming giant seeks to bring costs under control amid uneven subscriber growth. The job losses, which represent around 3% of the workforce, will mostly affect workers based in the US. The company is retooling operations after losing 200,000 subscribers during the first quarter. 
Bloomberg has learned that Tesla is taking steps to ramp up output at its factory in Shanghai. The electric vehicle maker will partly suspend manufacturing until early August so it can upgrade production lines. Bloomberg sources say the move will push Tesla's output in China to more than a million cars a year from the previous capacity of 450,000. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Danny? Alice, thanks so much. Now, let's get to one of our top stories today and the equality story. Rick Lewis is the owner of Britain's largest black-run business, Tristan Capital Partners. It's a London-headquartered real estate investment management boutique. Now, his charity each day, every day, helps with disadvantaged students with their higher education costs and is supported by the British rapper Stormzy. Now, Rick also chairs Impact X, a, capital, a venture capital fund that supports underrepresented founders. And Rick joins us now. Rick, good morning to you. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning. I, I want to start there on, on Impact X. Look, it's a conversation we frequently have that minorities, underrepresented populations struggle to get funding. But of course, you're on the ground. You're looking at the day-to-day -day lives of this. Just how bad is the problem? Has it improved at all since you've been working with Impact X? No, sadly, it hasn't, Danny. I mean, it, we thought sort of after George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement that it was going to improve. But like, if you look at the numbers, they're horrible. Uh, 20, uh, a quarter of 1% of all VC funding has gone to black entrepreneurs and two tenths of 1% has gone to black female entrepreneurs. That's after the upswing in sort of social conscience that we were going to change this balance. And the initiative on, on the part of so many organizations to put themselves out there to attract this funding, really well-qualified teams looking for capital are still not getting it. And I'm at the coal face of it, so I can tell you that the numbers look bad. There does seem to be in the wider VC space, Rick, this reckoning that's happening. Folks paid up a lot, valuations were elevated, and now some of that is starting to come down. What does that mean in trying to get funding for underrepresented founders in this current, again, rethink of the VC space? Yeah, yeah, I don't want to be pessimistic, but it's not good news. As values are coming down and marks are coming down, there's, there's going to be a smaller pie, and then people are going to be forced to make harder decisions about what they want to back, which funds and, and uh, initiatives that they want to put capital into. And that means they're already bad or difficult decision that they're not putting capital into underrepresented, underchosen founders is going to become an even tougher choice. Let's extrapolate that to the wider economy. You, of course, also have each day. Every day we spoke about that in introing you, a disadvantaged students helping them with higher education costs. What about the wider economy, the downturn facing there in terms of minority populations? Yeah, as the, as the challenges to the UK economy increase, the, you know, the cost of living increases, amplifying inequality among our population. The hard facts are that it's not a level playing field when it comes to economic opportunity and economic employment and quality of opportunity. Uh, unemployment rates are consistently higher among black and minority populations and wage rates are lower. That disparity looks to get worse, unfortunately. What we're trying to do is that we believe that education is one of the most potent and productive pathways to demonstrable social change, equality, and greater productivity among our population. And our, our foundation, the Black Cup Foundation, has been doing the providing both capital and resources, coaching and mentoring to young students in underrepresented populations through our Black Cut Scholars Program. Since 2013, we've endowed over 500 scholars at 125 colleges, universities, and programs across the UK. But what I can tell you is the need's getting even greater. Our application has mm. doubled in the last 12 months and probably four to five times higher in the last three years. I have to say, you do, do see some asset managers, some private funds, well, many of them acknowledging the issue in terms of inequality in the world. A lot of them, you know, hire an impact uh, chair. They start an impact fund. I, I, I wonder how real and how effective these types of efforts are, Rick. I mean, are we going to have a situation where, you know, the greenwashing debate that's happening right now, we sort of refocus that and perhaps say, look, there's also diversity washing going on. I, I want to be polite but direct. The truth is that people, the pendulum did swing in a positive uh, way to people thinking about these issues and trying to take the first steps of coalescing some of their organization to address them. But the truth is the capital, the movement, the impact hasn't happened. It's only, it's starting to happen. And now as there are bigger exogenous events, the economy is starting to, to weaken. There's a bunch of reasons and rationale to forget about those initiatives and stop doing them. 
I can just tell you that mm. the need isn't getting smaller, it's growing. All right. Well, Rick, we, we can't have you on without talking about real estate. Of course, that's what you do at Tristan Capital Partners. We're talking about sort of this concern about the economy, that this doom and gloom. Take me to what that means for UK real estate. When you did have a weaker sterling, you had, you know, outside money coming in, international buyers, you had pay rises coming in through the finance sector. So you, you did have this positive environment. What happens now that, again, we're looking at this economy that looks like it's on the precipice of turning or perhaps is already there? Yeah, we did have some really positive traction and, and there are still elements of that in the economy. Uh, there was a great way to capital moving into alternatives and moving into real estate into our space. Uh, we had started to return to work and return to economic activity. We could see that across our entire portfolio. Uh, so things were starting to be optimistic. But with the economy starting to change, interest rates going up, you can start to feel the beginning of a pause. Certain trades in sort of our space are slowing down. Some would say that if your organizations like us that have conviction and capital and been around a long time and have a great network across the marketplace that that will be an opportunity but there's certainly um, a little bit of rough patch before we get to the opportunity and we're in the middle of that right now rick just quickly has the sort of return to office narrative ha has that normalized yet yeah i think it has i mean i think that there was a great concern that we weren't going to need any of the office space you know out there in the world and that just hasn't been true what we've seen is office rates for the best qualified sort of non-obsolete offices going up. So occupancy has gone up and um, uh, lease rates have gone up. Uh, you know, the weakening of the economy will it will dent that a little bit, most certainly. But um, but uh, mm. the the story that the, the office, uh, the death of office was imminent is, you know, was overplayed and, and has turned out to be untrue. Rick, really great to catch up with you this morning. That's Rick Lewis, chairman of Tristan Capital Partners and Impact X. Now, coming up, we're going to dive back into the market story. Jay Powell vowing to beat inflation. Fed Governor Michelle Bowman backs another 75 basis point hike. Bonds, yields, those continue to drop as equities rally. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now let's get a quick look at the markets as we close out the hour. European stocks continue to rally. Again, it's this rethink of the inflationary story. You've had metals, you've had oil, all of them coming in. I should say, you'll see at the bottom of your screen there, oil is moving slightly higher. However, it did fall more than 11% in five days at, at one point. So again, if commodities are turning, is it a sign that the inflation fight coming from the Fed is finally starting to take hold. It's not unreasonable that we see a rethink in rate pricing. This is across the world. You're looking at two-year yields, be it Australia, Canada, U.S., U.K., Germany, all of them collapsing this week, a move into not just yield, uh, not just bonds, I should say, but really haven assets in general as we have this re recession discussion. However, is it what the Fed wants to see again to get inflation into check. Aussie bonds, those falling uh, more than 40 basis points over the week. Two-year yields in the U.S., those down more than 20 basis points. Well, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition will continue in the next hour. Matt Miller, Kaylee Lyons, and Anna Edwards have that for you. This is Bloomberg. It's unconditional, our commitment is. We really need to restore price stability, get inflation back down to 2%. I think there's a notion of a wage price spiral here. We need to make sure that we have enough oil and gas in the economy now over the next several years to meet the demand that we have in the economy. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Friday, June 24th. Our top stories today. Moving in different directions on guns, the U.S. Senate passes a bipartisan gun safety bill by a wide margin. That happened hours after the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling that could lead to more firearms in the streets of big cities. 
A warning for investors from SockGen. If the past 150 years of financial market history are any guide, the S&P 500 may have another 24% to fall by the end of the year. And a major election upset for Boris Johnson. His Conservative Party suffers a double blow in regional by-elections. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. The conversation in here, here in London, Kayleigh then sidetracked, distracted a little by the politics. But from the market's perspective, bad news seems to be treated as good news right now as everyone tries to second guess the Fed once again. Yeah, at what point is the Fed actually going to have to pivot back toward easier policy if they're too aggressive on the tightening and we see a slowdown in growth as the, as a result? You're trying to see the bond market price that in, which is why we've seen yields coming in really across the world. And that has given a lift to equities. At least that was the case in Asia overnight, where the MSCI Asia Pacific Index was up about one percentage point. But really, the move was led by Chinese technology stocks. Again, sensitive to the rate story. The Hang Seng Tech Index was up about four percent. As for that rate story, we see yields coming in again around the world, but it has been really dramatic in Australia this week. I'm talking double digit basis point basis point moves basically every single day. Today, the five year yield down 14 and a half basis points back down to 342. Finally, I would just note that the dollar is weaker against the yen or the yen stronger against the dollar for a third day in a row. It is a small move, but really reflective of that haven bid lifting the yen off of its weakest level since 1998. Right now, dollar yen trading just south of 135, Matt. All right, so coming back in a little bit, I'm looking at futures that are rising again. Well, I should say rising after a gain in the cash trade yesterday. Right now, two-thirds of 1% in futures. The cash trade, we were up almost 1% on the S&P. It was mostly defensive stocks that rose yesterday, but some tech names, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, really leading the gains. And tech is what's leading the gains today around the world as well. U.S. 10-year yield coming down as investors buy that debt right now, 3 spot zero eight. And I keep saying this, but, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we were up at 350. So we've come in more than 40 basis points over the past couple of weeks. We've come down um, about $20 over the past week and a half on oil. We're up today right now, 75 cents to 105.02. But just last Tuesday, we touched 124 in uh, intraday trading. So really interesting moves there um, in commodities. And then Bitcoin, of course, up right now uh, with uh, futures right now at 21,058 from midnight. So gaining in correlation with other risk assets. Anna, what do you see in terms of European markets? Yeah, European equity markets then playing a little bit of catch up with the U.S., but also looking ahead to the U.S. trading session, no doubt, and seeing some positivity. So we're up by more than 1.4% on the French market in particular. The DAX also up by six tenths of 1%. So a bit of positivity, maybe that retrenchment in yield that we've uh, all been talking about, maybe that giving a little bit of uh, room at the margin for stocks to go a little bit higher from here. Let's have a look at what else is on the move on European markets this morning. And we've got the bond markets in focus. We've mentioned what's been going on uh, with yields. We we have seen some appetite for bonds of late. Things turning around perhaps a little bit at the short end of the two-year curve here in France. We see uh, some bond selling happening there and uh, those yields going a little bit higher. This is the natural gas price down by 1.5%. This is the European benchmark. And even the IFO Institute acknowledging we could see a recession in Germany. A lot of talk about where the German story goes next, how they manage to secure supplies of gas, and whether we will see a restart in the pipeline that's going to be taken offline during July, whether it will be restarted afterwards. That's something that the German establishment coming to terms with. What would happen if that pipe were not restarted after maintenance in July? This is the pound, 122.74 against the US dollar, so up a tenth of a percent. Losing earlier gains, though, Kaylee, we saw retail sales numbers coming in uh, and some revisions to last month that uh, weighed on sentiment. We saw the consumer sentiment picture looking the worst that it's ever been. And so as a result, a little bit of weakness came through in the pound, or at least it lost some of its earlier gains. The politics also in play for the moment on the sidelines when it comes to the pound. Uh, Zalando is down by 12.9%. This is a retailer in Germany, an online retailer. It's taking other online retailers and fast fashion names down with it today. A profit warning came through, Kaylee, from Zalando. And some analysts in this sector warning that expectations for this sector in an environment where consumers are squeezed are too high. And so we should expect mm. to see further downgrades coming through, Kaylee. Yeah, it raises the question of whether expectations are too high broadly, because given all the pain we have seen in equities, you haven't seen analyst earnings estimates coming down to the same extent. There's a little bit of a gap 
there. Now let's take a look at what is ahead today. It's Friday, but we still have a ways to go until the end of the week. It is the second day of a historic summit of EU leaders in Brussels. We'll be live from there in just a moment. Plus, we'll be getting more Fed speak and hear from Fed governors Jim Bullard of St. Louis and Mary Daly of San Francisco. And finally, the big economic data point to watch today, 10 a.m., we get the final print of June's UMICH sentiment index. How much will the surge at the pump weigh on consumer sentiment, Matt? And what do those inflation expectations look like? Because we know the Fed is paying close attention to those. Consumer sentiment, as measured by the University of Michigan, is already at an all-time low. Now, let's talk about what's going on in Washington. Um, it's being called the biggest breakthrough in U.S. gun safety in three decades. The Senate voted to approve bipartisan legislation that will um, beef up background checks, secure schools, and give states money to fight gun violence. Emily Wilkins, Bloomberg government reporter, joins from D.C. for more. Emily? So, yes, we saw this bill pass the Senate last night with a pretty good-sized margin. You saw 15 Republicans join Democrats in this vote. The bill is now going to be voted on in the House today. Uh, that's expected either this morning or early afternoon. We're not expecting to see as much bipartisanship there. We're, we know that Republican leaders in the House will be whipping against the bill, certainly a change from what we saw in the Senate with Mitch McConnell backing it. But that bill is still expected to pass and to make it to President Biden's desk. And, yes, this is a bill... And if you look at the last 30 years, uh, this bill is being hailed as one of the biggest when it comes to gun control measures. But you also have Democrats caveating it with it's still not enough. They want to be able to do more. You heard from Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who said that the reason that Democrats are behind this bill is because they could surrender to gridlock or they could choose to try and forge a bipartisan path forward. Well, and Emily, what a day for this bill to be voted on because it was passed in the Senate just hours after the Supreme Court struck down a New York law that limits public handgun carrying ability. We heard from New York City Mayor Eric Adams speaking about this yesterday. Just take a listen to what he had to say. The opinion claims to be based on nation historical past, but does not account for the reality of today. It ignores the presence and it endangers our future. So, Emily, obviously, this was a very high profile ruling from the court, and it comes as we're also awaiting a ruling from the court on abortion that actually could send the power back to the states, where the court said in this case the states can't have the power to choose on their own. There is a federal constitutional right here. What is the feeling in Washington this morning about the high court? I mean, there's certainly a question about what's going to be coming next. I mean, I think to a certain extent, a lot of people are expecting to see more restrictions on abortions with the Roe ruling. I think there was also not a huge surprise in D.C., given the conservative makeup of the court, that the ruling came down this way on gun laws yesterday. I think the question is, now, where do we go from here? And you saw uh, Mayor Eric Adams allude to it a little bit, and you also saw it in some of the opinions that justices wrote, that now there are questions about exactly how far states and localities can go on concealed carry laws. Uh, you saw Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Roberts note in their opinion that it's possible for states to limit who has concealed carry. It simply needs to be the same standard for everyone across the board. And Justice Stephen Beyer also mentioned in his opinion uh, that you also need to look at how cities should regulate areas where people gather in large numbers, like movie theaters, concerts, some of these areas where we have seen mass shootings. So I wouldn't expect this to be the last that we've heard on this particular debate on concealed carry, but this is certainly breaking new ground with the Supreme Court weighing in for the first time on carrying outside the home, uh, which has been an area that they've been really reluctant to touch in previous decades, but you are seeing mm. this new, more conservative court go ahead and take on some of these issues. Emily, thanks very much. Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government uh, with an important update there from Washington. Back to the markets. The S&P 500 index may have another 24% to fall by year end. That's according to SockGen, based on the past 150 years of financial market history, they say. Bloomberg's Danny Berger has been pouring over the details. Danny. Yeah, Anna, this comes from the quant team, and you know I love me some quants. It's an interesting uh, argument and, and thesis to hear, especially today on a day when stocks are rallying. 
perhaps due to the concern about the economy and what that means for the Fed. But basically, looking at this wide set of data, they argue that from the peaks, the fair valuation of when we enter into a crisis period and come out of it is far lower than where we are now. In, indeed, they say that from the January peak, we needed to fall about 40 percent. In percentage point terms, we're about halfway there. So it's not necessarily about valuations of this market. It's based on past crises valuations as well. And look, part of the conversation is perhaps we haven't fully capitulated and that's why we're not as low as where SockGen thinks we will be perhaps we'll get there there are signs of pessimism for example Bank of America says that through Wednesday there were outflows from equity funds the most in nine weeks so there certainly are concerns there but again that came before markets started to rebound so how much further do they need to go to fit in the opinion of SockGen that that sort of post-crisis valuation well, Danny, you mentioned signs of pessimism. The bond market clearly reflecting pe reflecting pessimism on the growth story in that we've seen yields coming yeah. lower, including at the short end, even though in theory that should rise even further due to expectations of Federal Reserve hiking. We heard from Bill Ackman overnight saying that the bond market is misreading the Federal Reserve. Yeah, two-year yields coming in 20 basis points this week. It certainly feels like this really momentous about face. But yes, Bill Ackman saying, I think the bond market is misreading the Fed. This is likely due to Powell's communication style and some wishful thinking on the part of investors. Inflation is out of control and inflationary expectations have become unanchored. So his argument, not necessarily that we're just overly pessimistic, but it's about Powell that perhaps the bond market has always interprets him as dovish whenever he goes off script. And that's why we've seen this change in price. I don't know. I mean, who am I to disagree with Bill Ackman? But it does feel like it's more inflation expectations versus reading Powell wrong. For example, break evens, those have started to come in as we've had this decimation in the prices of commodities. So the market is sort of turning on that, not necessarily thinking that the Powell, Powell's going to back out, but more perhaps that Powell is doing what he wants to do to slow down the economy mm. to bring inflation in line. But Bill Ackman does say, look, just because we're talking of a recession doesn't mean that inflation is going to come in. Well, and he makes a good point about even Cash Kari backing 75 in July and then other Fed governors coming out and supporting him. So um, maybe the market needs to get its expectations aligned with the Fed governors. Danny, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Danny Berger there out of London. Now, it's the second day of an historic summit of EU leaders in Brussels. Yesterday, both Ukraine and Moldova were granted candidate status for membership of the European Union. Georgia, meanwhile, was told it could win the same status if it meets certain Certain conditions. Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission president, spoke yesterday. Of course, the countries all have to do homework before moving to the next stage of the accession process. But I am convinced that they will all move as swiftly as possible and work as hard as possible to implement the necessary reforms. Maria Tadeo, Bloomberg European correspondent, joins us now from Brussels. So, Maria, leaders face challenging issues today on energy, on the economy. What can we expect? Well, Matt, we did have a historic breakthrough. Like the head of the commission, of course, alluded to there that candidacy status uh, for Ukraine. Remember, that had been the centerpiece of the Ukrainian foreign policy for years. They had campaigned uh, for the status candidacy happening yesterday, of course, endorsed by all of the European leaders. We should remind everyone, however, that being a candidate and a full member of the European Union is not the same thing, and the transition at times can take years. That's for the politics. But today, Matt, a lot of sobering up when it comes to the economy. And picture this. Of course, we know the European Central Bank is going to hike rates, but it's not clear that it's going to deal and bring down inflation. A lot of this driven by energy. And then yesterday, the comments from the German economy minister, Mr. Habeck, incredible language. He says Germany is facing now a gas crisis potentially, and that could be a Lehman Brothers moment for the energy market. To use that analogy, Lehman Brothers market moment for energy. Now, a lot of the conversation today focused on that, but the issue here, Matt, is that, of course, Russia could cut flows at any time. The European storage is not ready for that. We enter the winter months, the most vulnerable time of the year for European economies. And when I ask sources here, what is the plan B? Well, the issue here is that they don't have one yet. Maria, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels. And now to UK politics, and it's a double blow for the ruling Conservatives overnight. With two defeats in special regional elections, uh, called by-elections here in the UK. But while the results raise questions surrounding Boris Johnson's election winning potential, the Prime Minister has vowed to carry on. We've had some, some tough by-election results, and uh, they've been, I think, uh, a reflection of, 
uh, a lot of things, but we've got to recognise that uh, voters are going through a tough time at the moment. And I think that as a, a government, uh, I've got to listen to what people are saying. Bloomberg's Laura Wright joins us now from Westminster. And we only just came uh, through a no-confidence vote in the Prime Minister. He survived, of course, but damaged by that, Laura. Now these two damaging by-election results overnight, where does that leave him? Well, it's been a terrible night for the Prime Minister, the Conservative Party, losing two members of Parliament to opposition parties. And as you mentioned, this fuels speculation that another vote of no confidence will be held against the Prime Minister sooner than the usual 12-month gap from the last, which happened earlier in June. That raises the question over who would replace Boris Johnson. Favourites include Chancellor of the Exchequer Rishi Sunak or the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss. Look, in recent months, Boris Johnson has tried to betray the image of an international statesman, but he can no longer ignore the political turmoil at home. UK citizens' incomes are being squeezed, and overnight data revealed that consumer confidence has reached an all-time low, minus 41. To put that in context, usually minus 30 is a bearish indicator. It adds to a week where inflation reached a 40-year high. Real wages are falling, purchasing power is diminishing, the economy is grinding to a halt, and interestingly, a recent a recent poll from YouGov revealed that if a general election were held today, the opposition Labour Party would be the winner, not Boris Johnson's Conservatives. All right, Bloomberg's Laura Wright, thank you so much. Now let's go from politics back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. I have to begin with Zendex, which is Zendesk, which is the big software company. It is surging before the bell on reports that it's close to a deal to be bought out by firms led by Hellman and Friedman as well as Premira. That stock is up 48% before the bell. You're also seeing a gain, although not as large of a gain, for FedEx, which reported after the bell yesterday. Its earnings beat expectations as did its 2023 forecast. The company benefiting from the higher packages it's, or higher charges it's able to charge for packages. Some of those labor supply issues are easing. That stock is up about 3%. And finally, I mentioned how it was technology stocks in China that really led the way in Asia. So no surprise, those ADRs listed here in the U.S. are also moving higher. Alibaba, one of them, up about 3% before the bell, Anna. Kaylee, we'll get back to the bond market conversation shortly. Coming up on this program, Ian Seeley joins us, JP Morgan Fixed Income CIO. Does he think we've seen peak yields uh, for this year? Where do we head into the second half? And cracks in the ecosystem. How hackers stole $100 million in another crypto bridge attack? This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on both radio and television. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. We have seen something really weird happening in commodities lately. You saw a huge jump in a number of different commodities from uh, wheat to oil, and now a lot of them have come off. Certainly oil, as I was pointing out earlier, is down almost $20 in just a week and a half. Now, is that due to recession fears? And what happens if we do go into a recession? Simon White is here from the Bloomberg MLive team to answer this. Simon, you've um, got a, a chart for those of uh, our listeners on radio who can't see us. Walk us through what um, historical precedent shows. So I think it's really interesting, um, Matt. We obviously have had this sell-off in commodities, uh, as you pointed out. Uh, they've had a pretty good run over the last two years. Some of this could be, you know, just good old-fashioned profit-taking. Um, you know, we've also seen it in energy stocks, materials as well. But um, if people are selling because it's a recession, you know, historically, it doesn't really make much sense. And, you know, the chart you've got up there, you know, if you look at the, 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 the blue line, the flat line, it kind of shows that uh, for the median recession, let's go back to 1960, um, you know, commodities don't really do that much over the, uh, over the recession. That's very different to equities. Equities sell off before a recession. Uh, when the recession begins, they sell off more and they tend to bottom and start rallying before the recession ends. But you can see from that chart, commodities don't do that. Um, but on the other hand, if you have a 
recession that's really caused by commodities, so say the 1990 recession, the 1973 recession, so commodities are the problem to begin with, they sell off, that eases the growth problem, okay. and then you see a rally through the recession. Okay. So either way. Okay, now before Matt was really interested in commodities, he was very interested in the yen, so I need to get a question briefly, Simon, on that. How long can the BOJ keep up with what they're doing at the moment in the bond markets? It's getting very hairy. Um, they're obviously buying uh, JGB's hand over fist. They're approaching owning half the market. No other central bank has ever owned uh, that proportion of their, their, their government debt. Uh, you saw widening in swap spreads, so people are already wanting a premium to hold government debt. Um, you know, like a lot of these things, you don't know the exact time it happens, but you'll know it when it happens. It'll have big global repercussions. OK, and you think it's coming. Simon, thank you very much. Simon White of the Bloomberg Markets Live team. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go. Uh, that is the function, MLIV Go. That's the function for the Markets Live blog on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. Yields are steady this morning, but we've seen them come in dramatically over the course of the week as the market reprices the odds of a recession and what central banks are likely to do, not just this year, but beyond that. We'll discuss it all with Ian Steely, J.P. Morgan Fixed Income CIO, coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Moving in different directions on guns, the U.S. Senate passes a bipartisan gun safety bill by a wide margin. That happened just hours after the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling that could lead to more firearms on the streets of big cities. A warning for investors from SockGen. If the past 150 years of financial market history are any guide, the S&P 500 may have another 24% to fall by the end of the year. And a major election upset for Boris Johnson. His Conservative Party in the UK suffers a double blow in by-elections. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lyons in New York. And Matt, the focus here on the politics perhaps and indeed on the cost of living, uh, the focus in the US, well later we'll get some data out, won't we, on consumer sentiment, which is so crucial at this point. Yeah, and it fell to an all-time low the last time this data point came out. So I think it will be pretty interesting to watch. I'm fascinated by the moves in the markets actually this morning. The S&P futures are up two thirds of 1%. I don't think that's really the interesting part. We have had a turnaround in um, the 10 year yield now coming up by a basis point. It was down by a basis point earlier, but generally it's holding at around 310. For me, crude is fascinating. We just had Simon White on from the MLive blog. I'm a huge fan of his work and he points out that um, historically, going into a recession, uh, especially if it's caused by high commodity prices, you see a dip in those prices, but then during the recession, um, you can see a climb. We're seeing crude now start to climb back up again after falling from 124 last Tuesday to 102, 103 at the beginning of the week. Right now, 105.72, and this is for Texas Intermediate. Of course, Brent is a little bit higher. Finally, Bitcoin. Um, getting back to boring, 20,899. It seems to be holding at that round, a uh, big round number, 2021,000. 20, and of course, it moves just correlated with risk assets. So there it is. Uh, you can see it on the screen. And also, CRYP Go. Kaylee, what do you see in terms mm -hmm. of pre market movers? Well, I am really focused on some of those big tech names because, as we know, they have been so pressured so far this year due to higher yields. But as we've seen yields coming in over the course of the last week or so, they are finding a little bit of relief. And that is true in pre-market trading this morning. The likes of NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple, Tesla, all higher by 1% to 1.5%. But, of course, that only goes so far to help unwind some of the losses they have seen this year. All down at least 20%, Anna. Tesla is down 30% on the year. NVIDIA off by 45% on a year-to-date basis and the first half isn't even over yet, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so a lot, to, a lot to watch there. Kayleigh, here in Europe, we've got European stocks up by 1.3% this morning. Perhaps a little bit of the pullback that we've seen in yields in recent sessions, maybe giving risk assets a little bit more uh, room to run. That's not necessarily the case today. French two-year yields, just as Matt was talking about, on the 10-year over in the United States, we see those yields just edging up a little. But the direction of travel last week was yields were going higher really quickly, and then they've been coming down uh, this week. Uh, the pound is at 123.01 against the US dollar. A lot of politics to talk about. The risks to 
Boris Johnson and his uh, and his leadership right now. Very much the conversation here as he comes through uh, those by-elections with two defeats, even if he did survive the confidence vote some months ago or some weeks ago. Uh, the pound, though, perhaps responding to some of the eco data, it was under pressure in the earlier part of the session because of retail sales and consumer confidence. They were both weak sets of data here in the UK. Zalando, a German online retailer, down by 13%, and that is weighing on others in the fast fashion and online retail spaces. A profit warning coming after hours from this business, and we're being warned by analysts, Kaylee, to watch out for more of the same from others in the sector. Well, watch out, we will. And of course, Anna, we are also watching the bond market, as is Bill Ackman of Pershing Square. He actually says that the bond market is misreading the Federal Reserve, which he thinks might be the result of Powell's communication style. But just take a listen to one of these uh, quotes from these tweets. The Fed has a credibility problem as the bond market flat out ignores Powell's and the governor's commentary. This must be concerning to the Fed as managing inflationary expectations is critical to controlling inflation. Expect even more hawkish commentary until the bond market wakes up. Joining us now is Ian Steely, JP Morgan fixed income CIO. Ian, is the bond market asleep? I don't think I don't think it's asleep. I think the bond market is really discussing the the debate at the moment between inflation which is obviously high and needs to come down and the central banks are going to react to that but it's also focusing on the growth concerns and it's the growth concerns that are front of mind at the moment and we've seen some very weak pmi data this week we've seen some terrible consumer confidence data you know there's concerns about gas taps kind of being turned off to the to the eurozone and ultimately are we going into recession so the bond market is really trying to weigh up that dynamic and as Anna just said we had this really big spike higher in yields over the first half of this month um, and we're seeing those yields come back down. Maybe there was a little too much exuberance around inflation at the very beginning of this month and a bit of reality kicking in that actually there's, there's a growth side as well. But we are still seeing higher yields on the, uh, on the month at the moment. Mm. Yeah, we got a, a different view to Ackman's uh, yesterday when we spoke to HSBC uh, ab about the bond markets and we were talking to Stephen Major there, Ian, and, and he was saying that we won't see the amount of tightening uh, by the Federal Reserve that is currently priced into markets because he is more focused uh, on growth and he thinks that those growth concerns will catch up with the Fed. So do you think, with that in mind, where, where do you fall? Do you think we've seen peak yields? But I think the, the question that we really need to ask ourselves is where does inflation gets to and then when does it start coming down and then most importantly how quickly does it start coming down because um, in, in agreement with with those comments if you look through history if you've seen uh, slowing growth rises in the unemployment rate historically the Federal Reserve has been cutting policy the one time they didn't do that was of course in the early 80s under Volcker where they were tightening policy into uh, into a slowdown um, so I think we've got similar levels of inflation concerns out there at the moment um, but is the inflation structural uh, or are we going to see it come back down? And if we do see it come back down quickly and back down to levels that, you know, as Jerome Powell said, three to four percent, that means the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world can blink. But if we don't see inflation come back down that quickly, then ultimately the central banks are going to have to keep going and they're going to have to tighten policy to ensure it does come down and it doesn't get embedded. Mm. Yes, so whether inflation destroys demand, I suppose, Ian, and whether we see that happening yeah. and, and a slowdown results. Um, does that mean that you think it's still possible to get a soft landing or, or is that increasingly out of reach? I think you've described it in the past as being aspirational. It, it's definitely becoming more challenging. Um, I would have argued maybe a couple of months ago that, yes, it looked like we could see a sort of a path to a, to a soft landing, but we continue to see inflation higher than expected which means the central banks are going to have to do more and they're going to have to do it quicker so it is becoming a lot more challenging in our minds to get to that soft landing i guess the question then would be you know how how negative is the recession how deep is is the recession i think there's the debate around around that given still the pretty decent corporate balance sheets pretty decent consumer health that we see out there at the moment it, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be a slowdown in demand, right? It could be a pickup in supply. I've been trying to get a General Motors uh, truck for a few months now. They have trouble getting chips. They're having trouble building the legendary 6.2 liter V8 engine. But if the supply chain gets fixed and they can do that, um, does inflation come down? And could the Fed then cut rates, Ian, to reverse a slowdown in economic growth? Yeah, and I think these are all these are all great questions, Matt. And I think you know this is the supply chain discussion. We've been sitting here for the last year talking about supply chains improving, um, and they haven't. And we've continued to get supply chains disruption. 
if we do see supply come back online, then actually that uh, you know, that will bring inflation down. I guess again, the question is how quickly can it do it? And then there's that there's that issue from a central bank standpoint: is are they are, are they going to be able to time this perfectly? Are they going to be able to stop tightening at exactly the right time? Because we know that as they tighten, it has an impact six, 12, 18 months down the line. Um, and they don't know exactly what that impact is going to be. So, again, that's the kind of the aspirational, that's the challenge that they're going to have, is making sure that they stop tightening at the right time. That means they can ins instigate that, that soft landing. I think that is going to be going to be difficult. By the way, if I look at um, INGO on the Bloomberg, Ian, and see all these year-to-date losses across every form of fixed income index, um, with the exception of China aggregate and Asian Pacific aggregate, I wonder where I would go in and start to buy if I wanted to, you know, do a little bit of bottom feeding or bargain hunting. Where, where, where do you find interesting? So I think there has been a lot of repricing within parts of the emerging markets. So you can make a you know, decent argument that the uh, developed market central banks have been a little late to this tightening party. Um, but the emerging markets were going, going at it last year. Um, you've got some uh, big moves, places like Brazil, which have hiked rates from 2% to north of 13%. So we have already seen a significant amount of repricing there. I think there's some value to be had. Um, and then when you look at the credit markets, as I said, corporate bond, corporate health still looks, looks good to us. And, you know, maybe leverage ratios not decreasing as quickly as they were. But if you look at front-end yields there, 35 to 4%, the break-even on them or the amount that yields would have to rise over a 12-month period for you not to have a positive return in those in those spaces, they're becoming quite compelling. So I do think there's in areas of the fixed income market where you should be interested in. I also think we're getting to a level now where maybe we get back to the normality of correlations where when risk mm. doesn't do so well, bonds start to perform again. And we're seeing that in the last, last few sessions. Yeah. We saw that a little bit during May. And I think, again, there's an argument that you, if you have a diversified portfolio, North of 3% is probably not a bad time to own some core bonds. OK, Ian, thanks very much. Ian Seeley of JP Morgan. Uh, two guests in two days pointing out uh, emerging market debt markets to us. Coming up on the programme, cracks in the ecosystem, how hackers stole $100 million in another crypto bridge attack. We will talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, BNP Paribas USA CEO Jean Yves Fillon. That's at 10 a.m. in New York, 3 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Well, turning now to crypto, another cryptocurrency bridge was hacked, this one amounting to $100 million stolen. It's the third major bridge hack this year. Joining us now to discuss is Bloomberg's Justina Lee. So, Justina, obviously a bridge is a way for people to swap coins from different blockchains, but they seem very, very vulnerable. One estimate shows that more than a billion dollars has been stolen from bridges. I can't imagine this helps confidence at a time when crypto, the entire ecosystem, is so vulnerable. Yeah, exactly. I think what this is kind of showing to people is that these bridges are particularly vulnerable to hacks, partly because their technology is so complicated. Now, in this case, it seems like what happened was one particular private key was compromised, and you do need some of these mm. keys to access the bridge, and kind of when when one of them is compromised, that kind of opens it up to the risk like these. There was actually a, a day on Bloomberg Television when I gifted some co-anchors uh, some Bitcoin and they showed the private key. It was stolen within literally like 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> but there are ways to fix that technology, right? This isn't about the blockchain. This isn't about cryptocurrency. It's really about the software that's used to move um, these things around after you take it off one blockchain to put it on another. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of people in crypto are going to try to fix this because we're, we're kind of moving toward a world where it's not just about the Bitcoin blockchain, it's not just about Ethereum, but different, you know, teams are coming up with different blockchains, you know, the Binance chain or Polygon. And so kind of finding a safe way to move assets between these blockchains is going to be increasingly important. That's important. Also important is keeping an eye on all of the latest news flow around particular coins because some of that is spilling into other spaces isn't it, Justina? I mean, we had Terra and Luna and Celsius and Babel and, uh, and, and Three Arrows and all of these names that we've mentioned over recent weeks. And, and yet there are more coming. You know, we, we, it seems almost daily we see other uh, areas of the crypto space where either withdrawals are being halted or sort of frozen. Is there a sense that we're at the end of this yet? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like for any economic historian, this is going to sound pretty familiar. Essentially, what we're seeing is like this domino effect of losses across the ecosystem because of county party exposure. And I think, you know, one thing that's that's really interesting is kind of to see whether this ignites another crypto winter. And the last one, what we saw was prices just didn't really move for a real long time. And so interest in the general industry kind of waned. And, you know, more recently, we have seen Bitcoin bounce back a little bit. Of course, that's just because sentiment across risky assets kind of all went up. But I think it's a little bit different for crypto because a lot of these assets are entirely based on, you know, optimism to kind of put it in a nice way. And so once you kind of have confidence buckle, I mean, you can see a lot of tokens go straight to zero a lot more quickly than I think we would see in the stock market. But Well, because there are 20,000 tokens, right? I mean, it's unlikely that you see... I think even David Rubenstein said he doesn't think Bitcoin's going to zero anytime soon. There are still a few um, blue chip cryptocurrencies, if you will. Yeah, that's right. I mean, correlations across the space is very strong. So usually if Bitcoin goes down, you will see the altcoins go down. But I think one thing that might be different this time from the last crypto winter is now we have like all these crypto billionaires who've made so much money from tokens that they might just kind of try to hang on and keep the money within the ecosystem. But so far, at least, it's pretty clear that, you know, the, the weakening of sentiment is affecting, you know, everything from stable coins and NFTs. And at least I feel like a lot of retail traders are probably gonna give up at this point. All right, Justina, thanks so much for joining us. Justina Lee talking to us about the most recent heist in the crypto universe. For more on the world of decentralized finance, less uh, theft, Tune in to Bloomberg Crypto Tuesdays at 1 p.m. New York time. Next week, we're going to speak with a superstar um, of the industry, Mary Catherine Later, former rising star at BlackRock, so in TradFi, as they say, defected to DeFi. I'm really looking forward to that. Of course, Kaylee and I anchor Bloomberg Crypto every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Do tune in. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York and Anna Edwards in London. European gas is set for a second weekly gain as global commodity shocks continue to intensify. And of course, prices at the pump here in the U.S. have caused a lot of concern in Washington. But isn't this what we wanted? Higher prices mean people are going to use less fossil fuels. Emma Champion joins us now. Bloomberg NEF, head of regional energy transitions. Emma it's interesting to see, you know, especially with President Biden, when he was um, when he was running for office, it was all about fighting climate change and stopping people from using oil. Now he's begging producers to pull more out of the ground. Which is it? I think we're at this point in the transition, and especially when we look at the European context, where fossil fuels were at this tipping point before with um, power plants and renewables before the crisis actually at that competitive point. Now, we're seeing this increasingly uh, high inflation environment with commodity prices, and this is essentially making that gap between renewables and fossil fuels become more acute. So that inflationary pressure that's being put on the economy is increasingly stressing the situation. Mm, okay, um, and, and also what is, what is providing a lot of political stress at this point, and no doubt yeah. economic stress to come, is uh, the supply of gas from Russia. Yeah. It seems that Russia has been dialing down the amount of gas being supplied, and now there are fears in Germany that after some scheduled maintenance in July, 
there are questions being asked about whether that pipe will be turned back on again, which seems fairly extreme. What can plug the holes left by Russian gas then? Because this is what European politicians are looking to try to do. Yeah, absolutely. In the short term, we're looking for system flexibility wherever we can get it. So that means looking at coal, that means looking at um, the revival of LNG imports into the European region. Now, what European policymakers are really focusing on is actually how to, in the medium term, um, decouple the need for gas in the European economy across industry, across power and across buildings. So the medium term strategy is to deploy renewables at an increasingly fast pace, to deploy heat pumps to get gas boilers out of people's homes and to also increase the use of renewable hydrogen uh, in industry. And those are going to be key drivers of destroying gas demand across the European economy. You know, one of the many things that the Germans did wrong in recent years was to phase out nuclear power um, and, of course, relying on Russia for the lion's share of their energy needs maybe also wasn't terribly intelligent. Are we going to see countries uh, moving more local in terms of power generation uh, to cover their own needs, independence? I think so. This this focus on diversification and decarbonisation, um, and especially the growth of renewables, will enable countries to be more self-sufficient in their renewable in their energy production. Um, but when we think about the supply chain dependencies that we have um, in the system, there is there's very much a situation where um, importers for clean energy projects will, um, you know, we're already tracking the fact the fact that four to twelve percent of levelised cost of electricity on new power projects. Um, is, is increasing those prices for, for developers, and that's causing many headaches across the supply chain. Now, I want to talk about nuclear because, mm. because you mentioned that this is, this is a really uh, hot political starting point. As, as we know, uh, many, um, many countries are considering whether it's worth this being a solution. From our side of things, we still think nuclear is, is too difficult to actually deploy as a solution because it takes a very long time to develop new capacity in, in the European region. Uh, it's politically sensitive and it's very expensive. What's more, when we look at how nuclear assets will actually end up behaving in, a, in the long term with our power system modeling at BNEF, um, we generally find that these, uh, these assets are less capable of dealing with the fluctuations in um, wind and solar output. Um, oh. And so they're, they're potentially less con compatible with the future energy system. What about gas? Uh, you know, I saw yesterday David Weston was talking with Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, who was saying, we need to be pulling more gas out of the ground. Now, that's also hotly debated, right? Because fracking leads to flammable water for a lot of people. Is it the right transition fuel? I think there's now a real pivot in the discussion from gas being seen as this transition fuel in Europe to being a energy security risk. And that is bringing up a lot of conversations around what can provide that clean backup um, if renewables uh, you know, can't, can't do everything for us. So at BNF, we know that um, we can get to about 70% wind, solar and storage in our electricity mix by 2035. But after that point, it becomes really difficult to actually fully rely on those sources alone. So we do need something else to bridge that gap. And up until this point, gas has been that source that we have been relying on in order to fill um, those lulls in, re in renewable energy output and to bridge the gap. So mm. I think um, what can actually replace gas, what can be that clean alternative? There are many technologies and, and certainly attention on, on those. We, we mentioned nuclear and um, there, are, there are other sources as well that might be in, in, of interest, including things like green hydrogen. That's definitely a um, very strong political interest in the, in the European Union at the moment. All right, Emma, thanks so much for joining us. Great having you on. We really appreciate um, your NEF coverage. Emma Champion there of Bloomberg NEF. Now, a look at what else we're watching. I'm focused on Pink Floyd on this Friday. Anna, you may have seen yesterday it's possible that this band could sell its music rights for $500 million, half a billion dollars. I will say my first concert ever at The Ohio State University was Pink Floyd, and they're oh, definitely one of my favorite bands of all time. Memories. So worth it. Special memories. I just hope my dad has forgotten that I once, as a child, recorded over his Pink Floyd tape. You know when you put the tape on those non-re-recordable cassettes, made them re-recordable? So now I've just reminded him that was probably a bad idea. I'm watching UK politics, of course. Surveillance is up next. This is Bloomberg.